working group report. So we're going to get a presentation from our educators here for about 15 or 20 minutes, and then we will have uh, about an hour and a half to have discussion. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Presidio. All right. Well, thank you very much, and good afternoon. Uh, I'm joined by Teddy Perderis and uh, Gregory Jones, who is our coordinator of World Language Programs. And we were just remarking that uh, we are both celebrating our two-year anniversary. And it was two years ago, almost today, that we were before the board on a world language presentation. Mm -hmm. So it's good timing. Um, we did want to thank the board for the opportunity to uh, work on this charge to examine our world language programming and think about how to expand international learning experiences in FCPS. We had a number of folks who uh, devoted quite a few hours uh, of time towards this effort. We had almost 40 people who served on our working group that began the work in the fall. Um, and they've been working very, very hard. A few of them are here with us today, and we'd like to thank them for all of their work and being able to be here with us um, as we make the report today. We had uh, central office staff, principals, teachers, and community members on the group. Um, they all worked uh, very diligently uh, reviewing best practice research, uh, analyzing existing programming in FCPS, and uh, providing the recommendations that are going to be before you today and that are contained in the report. A lot of time went into this effort. Um, Teddy Perderis has said on more than one occasion that uh, it was a nine-month process and it felt a little bit like being pregnant and giving birth. Um, I'm going to have to take her word for that. Uh, but Teddy has uh, done a fantastic job as the facilitator of the working group. Um, she's going to be providing the primary presentation today. Um, and I think this is just another example of one of her many accomplishments uh, and contributions to FCPS. And unfortunately, Teddy's going to be retiring at the end of the month, but we're lucky to have one more report uh, that she <laughs> provides to the board. So with that, I'm going to let uh, Teddy run through the presentation, and then all three of us will be available to answer and address any questions. So it is our great pleasure to be here today to offer you our World Languages Internationalization Report. So as Dr. Presidio just mentioned, uh, we received the charge from the school board this fall, and simultaneously we were reviewing our world languages programs to promote enhancements and also vertical articulation of the program. And the school board charge was to establish a working group to develop recommendations to improve world language delivery and engage with business partners in the diplomatic community. From that charge, the following scope and goal that you see up on this slide were developed, and that is to create a multi-year division-wide plan to develop internationally-minded students. And the plan contains two major components. One, to develop a way to provide world languages to all students in Fairfax grades K through 12. And secondly, to provide methods for enhancing and expanding our international and global experiences for our students. So to set the stage for this report, we'd like to uh, begin with a very short video. This was produced by Fairfax students at Longfellow Middle School, and it exemplifies some of the 21st century skills that we like to see for all of our FCPS students uh, exhibit as we prepare them to become internationally minded global citizens of the future. Uh, this is also aligned with our FCPS portrait of a graduate and the global citizen component. So the recommendations in this report were developed to be able to en uh, enable our students to reach the kind of goals that you see in this video. Now for ease of understanding, the video is in English, but I'd like you to imagine all of the dialogue transpiring in Mandarin Chinese. If you could, so everybody got their mental set ready? We're going to imagine all this in Mandarin, and let's go ahead and let's play the video. Right? <laughs> You can, if you hit the full screen there on the right, that for there, there you go. Sound. <coughs> Sound. Over on the left. You got this there. Okay. Maybe we can start at the beginning again. Do you think? With the sound, it's worth hearing. <laughs> no sound. Well, it has captions. It's got very cool music. So, <laughs> anyway, we'll just let you watch it with the captions here for a second. Oh, 
Okay. Maybe we can come back to that. We're having some technical difficulties, but that's all right. Okay, we'll move on. Can we give it another try over there? Good thing this isn't the technology monitoring report. <laughs> it never fails, right? It always works perfectly. I think, I think yeah. we can. And we can move on. Yeah, let's I think move we on. can move on. The link is there. Mm -hmm. You want to just go back? Yeah, let's go back. Okay, moving right along to our next slide. Um, we continue with our outstanding goals here, our student achievement goals that SAG 1.2, that all students will communicate in two or more languages. And we also have our ongoing goal that students will understand the interrelationships and the interdependence of the countries and cultures of the world. And in goal 1.2, the, the interpretation of that goal is that students will be able to demonstrate communicative competence. So we're going to talk about what that is in just a few slides down the road. Also, as we look at our new outcomes for our portrait of a graduate, one of the components is the global citizen component. And the global citizen component includes these three characteristics that we want to see in all of our future graduates from FCPS, that they communicate effectively in multiple languages, that they acknowledge and understand diverse perspectives and cultures and the consideration of issues that impact our local area, nation, and world, and also that they contribute to solutions that benefit the community, the country, and the world. So as we mentioned, we brought together a working group of 36 individuals that included elementary, middle, and high school principals, teachers, central office staff, and community members to work on developing these recommendations that you see in today's report. Uh, we functioned in a large group committee, also in three subcommittees to complete the work. There was an elementary model subcommittee that I chaired, a K-12 vertical articulation subcommittee that Dr. Jones chaired, and an internationalization subcommittee that Sam Klein, ESOL coordinator, chaired. And the report uh, in its full report includes a five-year overview implementation plan for each of the recommendations that is included. So we thought we'd begin by giving an overview of the recommendations so we can just really focus and be succinct and concise with our attention on the report because it is an extensive report. And then uh, we can go back and elaborate briefly on each one. All right. So uh, at the elementary level, there are four major recommendations. One is to expand school-based two-way immersion programs to additional schools. Secondly, to provide immersion programs in critical languages. Also to replace the FLESS program with a language through content approach, focusing in on STEAM concepts. And also to offer that type of program, not only at FLESS schools, but to all elementary students at all schools. At the secondary level, there are additional recommendations because as more and more students come up from elementary school with world language experience, there'll be a need to provide additional options for our secondary level students. The first of these is to offer synchronous virtual language courses as well as expanding our online campus language course options for students. Also to offer additional language courses at high school academies. Another recommendation is to condense and enhance the middle school offerings as well as to develop and offer a biliteracy diploma seal. Finally, the third area is internationalization and globalization, and in those areas, the recommendation is to expand in-person and virtual offerings for students and teachers, and also to enhance our relationships with the local embassies and international companies. So really, one of the foundations of this report is discussing what exactly is communicative competence. When we say we want our students to have communicative competence in a language, what do we really mean by that? Really, basically, it just means having our students learn to effectively use a language so they could use it at school, at work, and socially, effectively. Um, so as we think about language study over the years, you've heard people say, I'm sure, well, I studied Spanish in high school, but I don't really speak it. That is not a good return on investment. That is not what we want in FCPS. We need a good return on our investment, and we need our students to be able to effectively use the languages that they're learning. So we now have information on what exactly it takes to get us to that level 
you know, how many years of study and what kind of study does it take for our students to reach this level of communicative competence? So as you look at this chart, this chart is from our national organization for world languages called the American Council on the um, Teaching of Foreign Languages, ACFL. They have a language proficiency scale that you see on the left side of the chart. There are three basic levels, novice, intermediate, and advanced. Within each level, there's a low, mid, and high range. And the level of communicative competence is defined at being at the intermediate, high range, or above. So as you look at this chart, you see language study in grades K through four only takes students to a novice level. Even a K through eight sequence gets students in a low intermediate level. And what many students do in high school right now is take one or two years of high school in ninth and 10th language, or perhaps four years. And you see, based on national information, this still only gets most students to the novice level. What this information shows is that it takes an elementary and secondary sequence, a K through 12 or one through 12 or one through high school type of sequence to get students into this range of intermediate high, which is the level of communicative competency. So if we really want a good return on our investment, we really want our students to be able to use the language, we need to start language learning early and continue it all the way through. But there are a variety of advantages with uh, learning a second language. It's not just learning the language. Also, um, there's information and more and more research coming out, brain research, that focuses on how this can help students develop executive functioning skills. One of these is cognitive flexibility. Cognitive flexibility enhances uh, students' ability to look at multiple tasks simultaneously, look at issues from different perspectives. And there are also other cognitive advantages in learning two languages uh, within the realm of executive functioning skills. That includes enhancing functions such as attention, working memory, planning, and problem solving. So these are cognitive advantages that we really want all students to have, not just some students. So um, learning two languages can also help close the gap between students in poverty and those that have, are more fluent and are exposed to activities that develop these types of cognitive activities, uh, cognitive skills outside of school. So I know Mr. Stork has had that question from time to time. What about you know, language learning in some of our high poverty schools that maybe need to focus more only on literacy skills or math skills? The research now is becoming more and more abundant of the kinds of advantages, cognitive advantages learning two languages brings to all students and how it can help close the gap. Okay. <laughs> so as we look at our current state, uh, we currently offer world language instruction during the day to about 30% of our elementary students. 4% through immersion programs, 26% through FLESS programs, but right now 70% of our elementary students do not have access to a world language program during the school day. The total annual cost for these programs combined is 7.6 million recurring. And as we continue examining our current models, in uh, the immersion program uh, model, we have three different types. We have the two-way immersion programs, both school-based and lottery-based, and then we also have world language immersion programs that were previously called partial immersion. Now what these programs all have in common is they're all half a day in the target language, half a day in English. What is different is the student population. In the two-way immersion, half of the student population in the program must be native speakers of the target language, the other half are native speakers of English, and that way the students are role models, language models for each other. In the world language programs, um, in immersion programs, there's no 50, 50 percent student requirement of that type. The total cost right now uh, for those programs is 2.1 million dollars at the 16 sites. And for the two-way immersion, for schools to be eligible for that program, they have to have a very, very large population of native speakers of the language, at least 35% or more of their student population. And the school-based two-way immersion is a newer model that is highly cost-effective because there is no additional staffing needed outside of the regular staffing. It is cost-neutral for staffing, so it's very, very cost-effective, very low cost. 
So this takes us to the recommendations for elementary that we mentioned briefly at the beginning. Just like to elaborate a bit on each one now. Uh, the first recommendation is to expand the school-based two-way immersion program. And again, as I just mentioned, that would be cost-neutral staffing. There is no additional staffing for this program model. Uh, there are currently 21 schools that have a population of 35% or more of students speaking the same language in that school. And these 21 schools do not yet have a world language program. Um, the two-way immersion model is a highly effective model. It's proven to be highly effective both for native speakers of the target language as well as native speakers of English. It's also the most effective model for English learners learning English. Uh, so, very cost effective, very highly effective in terms of what the research shows. The next, and again, that would be offered in the schools that have a 35% or higher a student population speaking the same language. The next recommendation is to provide immersion programs in critical languages, such as Chinese, Arabic, Korean, those that are listed on our list of critical languages, both for commerce and defense. Currently, we do not have immersion programs in Chinese or Arabic. We have FLES, and we only have one immersion program in Korean and other critical languages of that type. So this recommendation is to offer one of these programs at a minimum in each of the new five regions. And again, we would look at staffing this as we do the two-way immersion and have a zone of proximity and bring in native speakers from that zone to create a two-way simulation. And then, again, this would be a very cost-effective model if it were staffed similar to a way that the two-way immersion is. We just want to highlight with all these elementary programs, the vertical articulation between elementary, middle, and high is critical. Uh, there needs to be commitment in the pyramid to offer the language all the way up so that uh, the students can continue their language. And we'll be talking more about this in the secondary recommendations about how to offer more options in that way in a cost-effective model. Again, looking at the current state, as we focus on our FLES programs, we currently have FLES programs at 46 sites. The target language is taught through reinforcement of our FCPS curriculum. And it's currently offered in two 30-minute sessions that equal one hour per week. This is right now offered in all students grades one through six in those schools. And the total cost for FLES is currently 5.5 million for the 46 sites. This past year, um, the Office of Program Evaluation completed a study of the FLES program. This was a six-year-long study. And the findings uh, of this uh, study were significant in that the major finding was that the FLES evaluation found that the program was found to be effective and should continue with modifications. Students in the program were able to meet the expected benchmarks. So although research recommends a minimum of 60 to 90 minutes for uh, this model per week, it's significant that students in the FCPS program were able to meet the benchmarks with the 60-minute model. Also, students with disabilities receiving FLES outperform students that were not receiving FLES on SOL tests. Now, more analysis needs to be done of this data to see what some of the reasons could be, but there could be a connection there with the cognitive, um, the, ex um, the executive functioning skills that develop cognitive, you know, f flexibility and cognitive enhancement. So this could be a connection there. But there also have been challenges with FLES, and we understand the challenges, and uh, these include time, scheduling, costs, and continuing language study at the seventh grade level and above. So the proposed recommendations that follow directly address these challenges. <clears throat> the next recommendation is to replace FLES with a new language through content model. And this would be an integrated STEAM or science-focused model, STEAM being science, technology, engineering, uh, the arts, and mathematics. The advantages of this model include that students would simultaneously learn language through the 21st century STEAM concepts. And this would maximize instructional time by learning language simultaneously through project and problem-based learning STEAM concepts. So it would be double bang for the instructional buck there of learning language through content, a very significant return on our investment. 
So now with the vote of the school board on June 26th with the elementary scheduling and the new elementary schedule, there's going to be increased flexibility in scheduling uh, in that students are going to have an additional two and a half hours per week of instructional time. And so schools can more easily schedule a one hour block of time in which they could offer this problem project based learning of learning the language through STEAM or science concepts. This would be a one hour block rather than the two 30 minute segments that are now in place which would facilitate problem and project based learning. This could be scheduled uh, much like art, music, and PE and other specials are right now. So all students could rotate through that one hour block. During that time, the classroom teachers do not need to remain with the students. That could be part of their additional um, planning time that's now in the new elementary schedule. And then the world language teachers would be with the students during that one hour block. To reduce the cost, also the staffing would be part of the triple T or specials staffing that you all approved uh, for the elementary calendar so that some of that could be dedicated to world language staffing to meet this new model requirement. So this would reduce the FLES costs at the existing FLES sites from 5.5 million down to 4.7 million by using that new staffing model and concept and staffing it more in the ratio of what art and music and PE teachers have. It's also recommended that this model be offered not only to replace the existing FLES schools and FLES programs, but at all other schools as one way to offer world languages to every student for a minimum of one hour per week. And again, based on our FLES evaluation, we see that that one hour model can and is effective here in Fairfax. So with the $0.8 million savings uh, that we'd have from the FLES program with that new staffing model, this program could be provided to all students for an additional recurring cost of approximately 7.6 million, which is the amount that you all recently approved for the elementary scheduling. Um, so let's take a look at this in a, well, it's in a chart form in about two slides, but let's look at how this could roll out. There are several factors to make this kind of model a reality. It cannot happen overnight. It would need to be phased in over a five-year plan. There's a more detailed version of this plan in the full report, but here's a chart that summarizes what that five-year plan could look like. This will include extensive teacher recruitment for language teachers that can teach language through content and STEAM. This would also include the development of the language through content with the STEAM focused lessons. Those have not been developed yet, so it would, it would uh, necessitate that curriculum development. And of course, professional development for the teachers. So the five year phase in plan included in the report is summarized in this chart. And on the left side, you see a potential rollout to the number of schools that could be added each year. And on the right side a simultaneous development of the curriculum that would be developed for grade levels each year until it was completed for grades K through 6. As we look at this next chart, this is a summary of where we are now and what it would cost and take to bring world languages to all elementary students. So currently, as we mentioned earlier, we're providing services to 30% of our students, about 29,000 students, and that's our recurring cost of 7.6 million for the current FLES and Immersion program. To bring this model and the other recommendations we had for Immersion, which had minimal cost, together to reach a 100% level of providing world languages to all of our students, it would take an additional 7.6 to 7.7 .7 million, which is the amount that you approved for the elementary schedule, to a total of 15.3 reoccurring. And that would be at the end of this five year period of full implementation. So of course, as we would begin providing more world language services at the elementary level, those students will move up to secondary. And so we need to take a serious look and offer options and recommendations for how we would accommodate this expansion at the secondary level as students matriculate up from elementary. So the next several uh, recommendations are focused at K-12 vertical articulation and how to expand these options at the secondary level. 
The first is to expand our synchronous virtual learning model. We do have one model now at Hayfield Secondary where a teacher teaches Arabic 1, 2, and 3 to a live class through closed circuit TV that we got through a federal grant. That class is beamed out to remote locations and students in different locations can participate in that class. We'd like to expand that model with more current technology through Collaborate and other means that we have now and offer more courses that way that would be synchronous virtual classes. So in that way, if students weren't able to enroll in a class face-to-face -face in their building, and face-to-face -face is still the best, met best method when possible, but let's say there was an enrollment of three students in Chinese three and the school couldn't offer it, if we would offer this virtual synchronous type of model, that would be one additional way to offer the class and not have to tell the student you can't take it because we don't have sufficient enrollment. Another way would be the second um, recommendation you see on this slide, which is to expand our online campus virtual offerings. We do have several language classes offered through our online campus, but this recommendation is, is to expand that to all the less commonly taught languages and different levels that aren't already offered through our virtual Virginia online courses and other than French and Spanish, which are already offered face-to-face -face in every school. An additional uh, recommendation to expand offerings at the secondary level is to add more language courses to the high school academies. Currently, we have um, language offered at Fairfax Academy, Korean and Chinese, and at Marshall Academy, we have Chinese, but we see a benefit to adding um, language courses not only to those academies, but to the other remaining four academies so there'd be more geographic access throughout the county. At the middle school level, um, we had been hearing from principals that there was difficulty in offering the variety of offerings for each language that are currently in place, and that students really wanted to get high school credit for each course they took at the middle school level as well. So this proposal is to condense and enhance the courses offered from eight to five for each language, and each of these would be credit-bearing, high school credit-bearing courses. And again, as we get more elementary students coming up to the secondary level with experience in world language, this aligns uh, even better and better meets their needs. And as students come up to seventh grade, they would be based in the appropriate level for their proficiency based on their assessment at the end of sixth grade. A number of states and also some divisions around the country are adding uh, a diploma seal called the biliteracy seal. And this uh, can be a locally awarded diplomacy seal that would recognize and reward students for their biliteracy. Um, you can see some of the states that are offering it there, and uh, more and more divisions and states are uh, adding this uh, as time goes on. So to get the diploma seal, students would have to meet the criteria in both English and in the, at least one additional world language. And then this would be offered as one of the diploma seals that we offer now. So to summarize the secondary recommendations, most of them have minimal costs or some startup costs and then minimal reoccurring costs. So all of those secondary recommendations that I just mentioned, the virtual and synchronous classes, the online, the offering at academies, and condensing and enhancing middle school, and the biliteracy seal, all those five recommendations combined would have a reoccurring cost of only $400,000 per year and a one-time startup cost cumulatively of $600,000. So they're very cost-effective, very minimal cost to continue that vertical articulation for the large number of elementary students that will be coming up in coming years. In terms of internationalization and globalization, there are a variety of recommendations in the full report that describe expansion of student and teacher international experiences face-to-face. Uh, -face. Uh, we want to keep increasing our potential to do that, but realizing that everyone having that international face-to-face -face experience is going to be very challenging. Uh, we do want to provide that at least virtually to all students and uh, to teachers by connecting more of our cl classrooms globally and interacting more globally on uh, every class and subject that we teach. And we also want to further take advantage of the community resources that we have here in this multilingual, multicultural Fairfax that we live in. Also, we want to continue enhancing our collaboration with embassies and international businesses, so the variety of more detailed recommendations on how to do that in the full report. 
Now, several of you uh, went down to Lubbock uh, to visit Dr. Garza there during the hiring process, and when you were there, some of you saw these Stevens Learning Systems Renaissance 2200 language labs. And so we just want to take a moment, and hopefully this video works. There's no sound, so it should be fine, okay? Um, and so let's just click on the video, and you can see how these work, and then we'll talk about those in a minute. Don't pay attention to the student yawning in the middle there. <laughs> This is not in Lubbock, by the way. This, this was not in Lubbock. This was elsewhere. This is just a... <laughs> So as you can see, they, the headsets come down from the ceiling, they store up there. And it's a really effective and efficient mode for teachers to be able to really enhance speaking practice for students. They can pair students together. They can listen to whole groups. They can interact one-on-one. -on -one. So it's a really effective and efficient system. Um, we currently have these in Fairfax already in four of our high schools. We have them at Fairfax, Westfields, Marshall, and Edison High School. Uh, the cost is approximately $25,000 per classroom. So to put one of these in every school, it would be about $4.9 million. But we included it here as an enhancement of consideration for all of you as you look at uh, future budget considerations. So in closing, um, we just want to uh, provide these recommendations to you as our recommendations for preparing our students to have the outcomes that are in our global citizen component of our new portrait of a graduate. And so we respectfully submit these recommendations for your consideration. And in closing, uh, it's a staff recommendation that you accept the report as presented. And we're now happy to answer any questions you may have about the report. Well, thank you very much. That was. Uh um, nicely condensed. Yeah. Appreciate that. Uh, do we have uh, any takers? Uh, Mrs. Strauss would like to go first. First of all, thank you very much. This is this is really very encouraging, and I think it gives us options and ways to go forward. And now that we have done the full day Mondays, it gives us the time, <laughs> the space, and potentially the staffing that we're going to need. Mm -hmm. So I have. Two questions. I know um, one of the one of the interesting recommendations was I'm assuming going from eight languages to five languages. No, what was that? Yeah. So that was going for each language going from eight courses to five courses. I'm sorry, I wasn't clear on that. So mm -hmm. what? Explain that a little bit more. Okay. So right now we have uh, for level one we have a part A and a part B that are over two different years. We'd consolidate that because the students come up from elementary with right. elementary language background. There'll be less of that kind of a need. Okay. We will still have a level one for beginners, however, okay. because we know we'll always have students that are moving into Fairfax that may not have had any language background or students that move in in fifth or sixth grade that would have less opportunity for languages. So there'll be a level one, a level two. We still have the immersion, level one and two, which I is see. more advanced because okay. those students have had half a day for six years. Uh, and then we also have the beginning level for novices. <laughs> okay, and then I would assume that the, the languages, because if we do a K-12, we, we now have some mm -hmm. um, esoteric <laughs> languages at the high school level yes. that we would never begin teaching at the elementary level. So what would we do? Because there's sometimes a kind of low enrollment language studies at the high school level. So what is the recommendation for those versus what we would teach beginning in kindergarten? Mm -hmm. So you're asking about language choice? Then? Right. Yes. Language, okay. Particularly yes. at the high school level right. where right. we know we right. would never. Yeah. So the process for language choice would continue much as it is now. Um, so elementary schools work with their school staff and with the community to solicit input on what kind of language the community would like to see offered in the school, and as well as the staff input. They also look at the home languages of the students, and those three components combined are what go into schools listing three major languages that they would like to offer. Those are submitted to the division, and at the division level, the final determination is made. We look at first, second, and third choice, and most schools do get their first choice, okay? But part of that commitment is in the pyramid, as they submit their language choices, they must have uh, previously met with the middle school and the high school and gotten the pyramid commitment to continue that language. 
And then some of these secondary recommendations we mentioned here, we hope will broaden those options and make it easier for middle and high schools to offer those options in various ways in addition to face-to-face. -to -face. So we would be thoughtful in what languages would be, would be offered Correct. so that we actually have an opportunity for a K-12 that is actually useful and sustainable. Yes. Over time. Um, so I have one other question. I can't remember what it was. You can come back to me. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, next is Ms. Hines, be followed by Ms. Dernick Kofax, mm -hmm. and then Ms. Evans. So, Ms. Hines. Thank you all very much. And this is a list of uh, really meaty uh, recommendations that we can really dig into as this, this um, group did a lot of good work. Um, I, I just had a couple questions. Uh, I think it was on slide 13 where you were talking about. Um, Test scores uh, and how FLESS has helped you know uh, students do better on SOL scores and the, it it's, it piqued my interest in how we are now measuring or how we plan to measure um, the. The, the effect of all this foreign language work that we do, because I do think it's important to have measurable outcomes, uh, when, especially when we're talking about spending more money on something. Um, right. So can you give me a sense of how we already measure outcomes in this and how we might uh, do better at that? Mm -hmm. Yes, so there are very specific measurable outcomes for both the FLESS and Immersion program, and those would continue. Uh, we have performance assessment, called our performance assessment for language students, the PALS assessment at the elementary levels, junior PALS, secondary, PALS, and that uh, assesses students' proficiency in both writing and speaking. And then we have scoring rubrics to determine if the students have met expectations, exceeded expectations, below expectations, et cetera. All that data is gathered and entered into our student information system, and then we analyze that each year to make sure not only are the students individually making progress, but that the program is meeting the desired goals. Okay, thank you. But you also uh, wanted to look at um, other uh, uh, improvements in achievement that yes. might flow from this. And that's an interesting idea. Um, yes. So maybe that's something we could continue to um, address, especially if we try to go to uh, foreign language and STEAM, yes. you know, because we'll be looking at those skills. So right. um, I'm not sure where to go with that, but yeah. And maybe I can just address that as well. In terms of the content areas, um, one of the appendices in the report it, our SOL results in all four of the core content, reading, language arts, math, and science, in all the immersion schools. And the reason it's an immersion is we don't have that full array yet up at elementary and th that level. But for all the immersion schools, students in immersion programs annually outscore students not in immersion programs in the same schools uh, on SOL tests in all four content areas. And you see that over the last three years of data, but that's been consistent over time. And that gets back to the cognitive flexibility flexibility and to the enhanced cognitive skills with learning two languages. Yeah, no, I, I see that. Um, I also think, and what I wanted to get on also to the um, FLESS because it talks about, um, it, it's more every child in the school has access yes. to. I mean, one of the things that we know about our immersion programs is that those are self-selected placements mm -hmm. and parents select that. So there may be a bias in the yeah. test scores because those kids come from families right. where um, the parents are selecting that program. I don't know. And it's, mm -hmm. it's always hard to weed out, um, the, yes. you know, what's going into those scores, but. Right. Okay. And some of our newer immersion programs are the two-way immersion in some of our high poverty areas where it's only school students within that school boundary. So those will be interesting scores to look at too. Also with FLESS in the evaluation, uh, SOL scores were looked at, and they were found to be about the same for students in FLESS and not in FLESS, but there was a significant enhancement for some students with disabilities uh, with the FLESS model. Interesting. Well, thank you. I'm glad you, you dove into the question of yes. measures, you know, because yes. I really think we have it's to. Important. It's great. Um, and then when we talk about uh, the, the new, it's so what you want to replace FLESS with, and I think it sounds wonderful, the idea of doing foreign language and also tackling STEM and, um, you know, uh, I, the one thing I was just wondering, I've, I have sat in on a FLESS uh, lesson mm -hmm. at an elementary school, mm -hmm. and it looked to me like basically a second grade teacher had brought her students into the classroom, and the FLESS teacher was teaching that class of students, and the second grade teacher, I think, stayed in the room, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of wondering, just sort of the picture on the ground, how would this be different? Would be, there be more than one second grade class in that room? Is that how we make the ratio higher, or how does that work? 
Yeah. So this would be included and staffed like the triple T staffing, which is the art, music, you know, PE. And so that staffing ratio is a higher student to teacher ratio than the current FLES right now. The FLES, the initial staffing, the way that was developed is um, in the early years, there was time included for them to develop the curriculum themselves also. So that's why it was a little bit, you know, lower student teacher ratio. But now the kind of curriculum we're talking about would be developed at the division level and provided to every school so that every classroom weekly would be doing the same kind of project-based, hands-on, problem-based learning lessons so teachers would not have to be developing those lessons themselves. Okay, so the language teachers, oh, go ahead. We'll just add to the other part of your question. In the proposed new model of a 60-minute block, um, the general ed classroom teacher could use that time for individual or collaborative planning time. They would not need to stay um, with their classroom during the language through content lesson. Yeah. Right, yeah, and I see how that helps us with yeah. that question, right, yes. which is great. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, terrific. So I guess the, the, then the foreign language teacher in that situation doesn't need to have planning time to plan the lessons because the curriculum is ready to go. Is that the idea? Right. They would be traveling from room to room implementing the lesson, or in some schools they have a STEM lab or a designated site where they would be conducting the world language lessons. So it will vary school by school as to how it's implemented. Let me, let me be clear on that because I don't want to miss. I don't want anyone to be misunderstand. Okay. Any teacher with full time teaching responsibilities mm -hmm. will get the same amount of planning time as as all the other core teachers. Yes. So if I'm a FLES teacher and mm -hmm. I have full time teaching responsibilities, yes. then I will get the 60 minutes per day or the equivalent of, thereof uh, of, for, over the week because they have they have to plan just like everyone else right. does. Right. And so but the differentiation is you have to have the full-time teaching responsibilities. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so then if you, okay, all right, thank you. I think I got it. I'm just trying to figure out how we um, how we improve the cost by raising the ratio, just kind of what that looks like on the ground. I was just wondering how that happens, but mm -hmm. I think what you're saying is because the ratio for triple T is different. Mm -hmm. That's how we do it. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Hines. Next is Ms. Darnett Koufax, be followed by Ms. Evans and then Mr. Moon. Mm -hmm. Ms. Darnett Koufax. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pederis. Mm -hmm. um, what I love about your presentation. Uh, uh, no, it's Pederis. Oh, it's like Dr. <laughs> <laughs> He's retired. <laughs> no, I know who she is. I know who Teddy is. <laughs> and I am um, very excited to see what I love about your presentations is, is so much of what can be mm -hmm. and you've done that consistently and you will, will so be missed um, but um, I I want can we keep her Karen <laughs> <laughs> we've tried um, I'd, I'd like to uh, to utilize um, this time to talk a little bit about um, you. You talked about new research and the cognitive advantages to students learning two languages at a time and how it helps with their executive functioning functioning skills. Could you just please delve into that a little bit more? Mm -hmm. yeah. There's emerging research out of. Um, the uh, York University in Toronto, uh, one of the researchers' names is Ellen Bialystok, B-I-A-L, Y-S-T-O-K, and she's really doing a lot of brain research on how learning two languages develops executive functioning skills. And again, some of the skills that are really showing enhancement are attention, working memory, planning, problem solving, in addition to cognitive flexibility. Now, cognitive flexibility, that's one that's been out there for a while, we've been talking about for many years in second language acquisition literature, but some of these newer ones are coming out now and showing how these um, learning two languages can really develop these areas of executive functioning skills for all students. So this is really one important way we can level the playing field, particularly for our students in poverty, because if we offer this kind of skill development during the day, and maybe other more affluent students are getting access to skills of this type and development in other means after school and on weekends, this is one way we can really try to you know level that playing field for our students, regardless of what their background. Are. Right. I think that's important, really important to note, because I do think, you know, maybe just um, 
the thought process would go the other way, that, you know, students in poverty, they have so much to learn already, mm -hmm. and, but, but I love that this is so exciting and this is out there and this mm -hmm. is now proven, and I will be certain to go back and, and look at that because it's, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's very important because we, we talk about e equity on the playing field and within schools, mm -hmm. and as you said, sometimes that, that, that doesn't happen. Um, the, um, and I did not meet with Dr. Presidio, and, and I'm sorry just because of my personal circumstances over the last few weeks. So I guess on page 15, I have a little bit of a question with that chart. I understand how the curriculum, in the PowerPoint, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And it's probably very easily explained. Mm -hmm. But um, I, got under, I got the developing the new curriculum and how that's going to be done over a five year for each, mm -hmm. each grade mm -hmm. level. But then we talk about it on the school side. And you're talking about adding so many schools per year, and how? But then we call them five plus schools. Mm -hmm. are, are you just naming them differently, right. or we're, because we're eventually talking about right. utilizing yeah. the, um, you know, yeah. the, just just to clarify a little bit here, um, this would be the way the curriculum, the new curriculum, could be rolled out. Okay. Okay. That's so true. we do have some new schools that want to come on board right now in September. We're working, going to work very closely with them to see if we can make that happen. Um, and then we do want to continue, continue um, developing that curriculum and piloting it with some of the existing FLESS schools because those teachers are already accustomed to teaching language through content. So that pilot of the curriculum would continue in that way. Okay. And there's okay. a potential to add more new schools along the way. That's open for... Right. You know. That's a good question. If you don't mind my restating, just to make sure. Mm -hmm. So this chart has nothing to do with any goal around expansion of FLESS. This was speaking specifically to the new, the new. curriculum development and right. how that would be developed over time with certain uh, subsets of schools that are currently right. FLESS schools. Is this that is correct? The language through content model expansion, okay. right? Very good. Thank you. That that does help clarify for me. Um, and when you talk specifically about schools, I, I would like for next steps to know which schools we are looking at for implementation in the fall. And also, if um, I could also have for a next step, when we talk about the 35% or higher of the students who speak that language, which schools they are and how that immersion, two-way immersion would work, that okay. I would, I would okay. like mm -hmm. that listing. And um, I believe if I'm not mistaken, uh, it's been, I haven't read it since last Friday, but I believe in the superintendent's update, it has all the current FLESS schools. Okay. Where they're located, their percent poverty, I believe we had in there, and also those that are currently on the waiting list, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. okay. that was in there. Correct. I'll look again to make sure we have oh, yes. all the components you asked okay. for. Yes, that was there. Thank you. That was included, yes. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I'm done. Um, Mr. Okay. Annette Kofax, so for yes, clarity, yes, could I ask you to go through those two items? The first one was you would like to know which f uh, which schools will be adopting FLESS for the first time this fall. Correct, and Dr. Garza is telling me that, you know, both of my questions, um, yeah. well, well, two of my questions were answered there, and then the, the third one was um, those Language schools where she said there are certain schools where 35% or higher of the student's population speak that language, and um, that programmatic change could happen. I, I'd like to know which schools they are. Which are the schools that have a 35% or higher of students speaking a particular mm -hmm. language where, um, and I want to name the right program, where an I, one of the immersion programs would take place. Two-way immersion. It Two looks like we do need to go back. Some of our links are not working, Chris. Okay. From the superintendent's update, but the information should be there. We're just the linkings aren't, aren't working correctly. Mm -hmm. So we believe both of those questions, or three of them, or two uh, or the, three. The two-way immersion yeah. list has not been provided yet. We can provide that, okay. and that's based on current data. That may change over time. Right. right. Okay. So right. the action item is to provide uh, the two list of two-way immersion eligible schools. How's that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Next is uh, Ms. Evans. 
Thank you very much. I very much appreciate this report. It, I think you've done a great job of uh, very thoroughly outlining a way forward and something that's very important to this board. Um, I particularly like the idea of the, the language through content. Mm -hmm. I think that that's, um, that's the way to go. So I'm, I'm delighted to see that. Um, with the, uh, the two-way immersion, uh, like Ms. Derenek Kofax, I'm very interested in that area because mm -hmm. I believe my part of the world probably mm -hmm. has a number of those schools. Correct. And I believe, did you say there were 21? Is there are 21 schools currently that have that population of 35% or higher in one language, right? And that's and that 35 percent is considered the threshold by to be able to offer the two-way really immersion two school-based program within a school. Right. Are we primarily talking about Spanish? Yes. Right now, it's currently Spanish. We do have another two-way immersion that is Korean, uh, but there's not any other school that has that high of a population in another language group right now. Even Arabic? that may change over time. Well, I was thinking about Glen Forest in Arabic. Is that does that it's not getting close? That? Not quite there getting yet, close, but we can but not. be okay. checking on that because that I, I was I'm kind of keeping my eye on yeah. that. That one because that would be yes uh, you know a wonderful um, thing to be able to to provide yes a strategic we'll be open to any language, language right? you know as mm -hmm. as Arabic there um, I think also um, oh, the five-year plan is am I reading this that at the end of five years that all of our elementary schools would have some form of no that your five-year plan does not this five-year plan, that. as yes. I understand it, specifically right. relates to the new curriculum development that would be required by going to the new instructional right. uh, design. All right. But this would also offer it to all schools by the end of five years, right? It would so offer it, language? Language through content, the new model to all schools by the end of the five years. So, yes. so all of our all of our elementary right. schools would would have some form. That's of year five. Their remaining schools, all other schools. I right? see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now there are different ways that could be accomplished. This is what's in the report right now, and this is the plan that could be. Just for modeled. clarification, and I and I apologize that this uh, table is confusing. <laughs> um, what we're proposing that we would implement is a new model, language through content. Um, it's going to take time, however, to develop the curriculum for that program, which is why we listed FLESS on this particular slide to note the fact that as you're starting to implement the program, some schools are going to need to use some of our existing curriculum until we've been able to develop all of the curriculum grades K through 6 because we plan to develop the curriculum in a sequential manner. Okay. So I apologize. There's a lot of That's information right. on this slide yes, and it is confusing. Mm -hmm. But this slide shows both the development and phase-in of the curriculum and in the left-hand column it shows the development and phase-in of the number of new language through content programs. Right. Great. Well, I appreciate that clarification. Um, wh one thing that, that uh, I had asked in, in my conversation um, was about the plethora of languages mm -hmm. and how um, we deal with the fact that we have a certain mobility rate. And you had a, a, great, a great answer to that, Dr. Perdera. So I thought maybe the, the board uh, might be interested in that as well. Because of mm -hmm. course, it, when we're, we're teaching Spanish at one elementary school and then a child moves and then mm -hmm. it's Arabic, mm -hmm. how, um, how do you see that playing mm -hmm. out? Well, well, but the language acquisition research shows that as students study a second language, it makes it even easier to learn a third language. And so what's important is to develop that cognitive flexibility and those executive functioning skills. So even if a student would begin studying one language with one elementary and then move to another school that had another language, it would probably be easier for that student to start acquiring that language. And language study of any type is going to enhance the skills we've been talking about. Okay. Thank you. And then uh, last but not least, um, talking about a plethora of languages, um, we, we have a new language coming on board, and perhaps you would like to, uh, to uh, let us know what the status of that is as well. Yes, we're very happy to uh, be able to, a year from now, begin Vietnamese at the high school level, which is our third most spoken home language of students in Fairfax. Uh, thanks to Mrs. Evans there, we got it going in um, Falls Church High School. It will begin a year from this fall. We've developed the license with the Virginia Department of Ed. This next year will be the curriculum development and hiring of the teacher, and we plan to deb debut that as a new course, if all goes well, a year from September. And, and I then that could expand to other sites after that. And I think we're the first in the state, correct? Yes. To it's be a brand new that. licensure we created with the state. And so you, you are to be highly commended for having well, created team effort this. Here. We thank Dr. Um, Jones and, and the group as, who really spearheaded first, this. Right. And, for, and yes, Dr. Presidio, thank you so much uh, mm -hmm. for, for spearheading that. So thank mm -hmm. you.
Okay, next is Mr. Moon. Uh, to say that I'm so excited to receive this report is an understatement. Mm -hmm. I've been waiting for this for a long time, many, many years, uh, that uh, I thought about this, whether I should share this with my colleagues on the board, but because well, but let me do one of the five. I'm going to do that anyway. And I'd be reprimanded perhaps by Mr. Vakov for taking too much time. Recently, there was a state visit to Korea by the president of China, mm -hmm. you know, Xi Jinping. And last year, Korean president visited China. Mm -hmm. The first female Korean, mm -hmm. uh, first female president of Korea. Mm -hmm. And she also visited the United States last year and spoke in the joint session of Congress. And usually when the foreign chiefs come to US, they deliver their speech in their own native language mm -hmm. rather than English. Mm -hmm. But the President Park is a lady, female president of Korea. When she spoke in joint session, she did it in English. Mm -hmm. And she did not learn her English in any English-speaking country, but on her own mm -hmm. in Korea. Mm -hmm. And she also learned to speak Chinese as well. Mm -hmm. So when she visited in China, she spoke part of her speech in Chinese. When President Xi Jinping came to Korea, she delivered the speech, part of the speech in Chinese. It was greatly praised by Chinese media. Mm -hmm. And that's one area really, that's, that just shows how important in you know, having a language ability. Mm -hmm. You know, another language, mm -hmm. you know, helps in doing with even the diplomatic relations at the level. You know, have, uh, having said that, I have to have some questions. Are we, I support where the step one us, you know, want to take us to. Mm -hmm. uh, and so let me let me ask you this way: since we'll be we'll be discussing the year end budget review, whether if he want to go this way, if mm -hmm. board want to give you a full blessing, mm -hmm. what will be the first year cost, and when do you expect that? first year to be, whether it is FI-15 or is FI-16, mm -hmm. and if it's FI-15 or 16, mm -hmm. how much is the first year cost? Mm -hmm. Because I don't remember seeing the first year cost. Mm -hmm. It may be hidden in that very thick report. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> so let's take it level by level, starting at the elementary level. So at the elementary level, any new schools would want to come on and offer world language this coming year. They could use part of the staffing that you have already approved for the elementary schedule, Triple T, to be dedicated to world language. So that would not be an additional cost beyond what you have already approved for the elementary scheduling staffing cost. That would be part of that. They would be dedicating you know, their staffing for world language out of that funding. Okay, to create the STEAM-focused curriculum, uh, what is in the report are two resource teachers. And those teachers will be working together, one language and one STEAM, over the next five years to develop and implement and support expansion of this program to eventually all schools, if that is what the school board would like to see. Um, so two resource teachers, those are included in the report. Uh, all the immersion recommendations totaled about $100,000 or between $100,000 and $200,000. It was 0.1 million. So that was limited cost as well. That is uh, exemplified in the report with more detail. That's elementary level. So elementary level, we're talking two resource teachers and between $100,000 and $200,000 to implement all the elementary uh, recommendations for this year because the staffing for new world language programs already been included in the funding for the elementary schedule. At the secondary level, again, if we would implement all of the recommendations at the secondary level, there's a one-time startup cost of 600000 total for all five of those recommendations, plus a 400000 recurring for all the recommendations if they all wanted to be implemented at once. Okay, but those could also be phased in over time. And then the internationalization recommendation just requires one staff person to implement all of those expansion activities that are included in the report. So minimal cost, it's one staff person. 
So let me go back. Let me go back to elementary school. You said two resource teachers plus mm -hmm. another hundred thousand dollars for the mm -hmm. immersion mm -hmm. program. If he do not invest in those resource teacher positions mm -hmm. and or that hundred thousand dollars for the immersion program, mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to implement the recommendations you are. Yeah. That's correct. As you know, with the FY15 budget cuts and IS, we did have 13 positions cut back, so it's going to be not possible to do this with the existing staff. We're already doing more with less, so we do need, it's actually two and a half resource, two are for the language through content, a half resource is to expand the immersion to the additional 40 schools that are listed there. Okay, I'm trying to be a little, more, a little clearer on this one. Mm -hmm. So if you provide these resources, you have just delineated mm -hmm. the actual implementation, the phase in implementation mm -hmm. of these recommendations, are they going to occur in FY16? I'm talking about classroom instructions mm -hmm. benefiting you know, students mm -hmm. rather than curriculum development. Mm -hmm. Or will any part of that will start from FY15. Mm -hmm. I guess I guess FLESS program might be able to start right. from FY15. So the new world language program, and we do want to call it you know, the new language through content, but to start, they'd have to use the existing FLESS curriculum because the new curriculum is not ready yet, okay? So we could start with, from that list of 11 potential schools that you got as part of the superintendent's memo this week, uh, as many of those that can start, we're working with them to see how many can start this fall. It could be several, okay? Those would be funded under the elementary staffing that you just approved, all right? So there's no additional cost for that. But to begin this process to create that curriculum, we need the two resource people for this to be able, that to be possible to expand. So the resources that would be necessary mm -hmm. would be for funding the, the new curriculum design. Correct. So the staffing, assuming, you know, staffing and getting people ready to op implement current FLESS, yeah. you know, it is a gradual process, right. but in terms of staffing, we now have the resource to do it. Mm -hmm. But if we want to shift to new design, we're going to have to invest in some curriculum design. Right. Is that correct? That's correct. I mean, I certainly will be, uh, I'm sure the co my colleagues on the board will also agree with me on this one as mm -hmm. far as learning world language is concerned. You, you have to start from a very early age. Mm -hmm. and. That, that just like full day K, when the board initially said that we we're going to do it in over three year period, that because of financial resource restraint, that has taken much longer than we wanted it to take. Mm -hmm. But for the f foreign language acquisition, uh, for the language acquisition, I think board, you know, this board might have to take another bold move. Next is Mrs. Smith. My only frustration is five years. <laughs> I wish we could do this tomorrow. Um, you've referenced either science or the STEAM, mm -hmm. but I haven't heard any preference or um, thought about what would be the best choice and how that decision making would work. You want to do we're trying to move to a STEAM model with our focus on portrait of a graduate outcomes mm -hmm. and critical and creative thinking, and um, that is our preferential model, but it also takes more time to develop interdisciplinary units that are project-based. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to highlight is that we may end up doing some things kind of in that interim period as we're developing the curriculum that may be a little bit more heavily science-focused until we can integrate the arts into some of those content areas. So we're just really trying to be transparent, again, and paint the picture that it's going to take us a while to develop this mm -hmm. curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, as Dr. Garza has said, we can do the staffing piece now. Mm -hmm. We can put the new program design in place in the schools that we currently have, our 46 schools, and in new schools, if we can hire the teachers mm -hmm. to be able to deliver the curriculum, okay? So that's why we're suggesting a conservative number of schools for SY 14, 15. But the thing that's gonna take us the most time is the development of the STEAM okay. curriculum. So we see that developing over, again, that five-year period mm -hmm. of time. And I, I think that the hardest part is to visualize how is the word out there and people getting trained to be teachers that, whoa, mm -hmm. we want mm -hmm. this yeah. for starting in our elementary right, schools. Right. And we've been collaborating closely with not just George Mason University, but other universities around the country so we can recruit teachers that not only have an elementary focus, but have that background on how to teach language through content so that we can really you know, utilize those skills. 
Okay, next is uh, Ms. McLaughlin to be followed by Ms. Schultz, then Mr. Stork and Mr. McElveen. Ms. McLaughlin. Um, I guess the first thing I'll preface again is I absolutely believe the research um, and the science behind uh, language acquisition and the earlier the child's brain is exposed to it, the better. Um, but that said, uh, I think I'm most uncomfortable about hearing things like uh, curriculum development. And I start to ask myself, so this doesn't exist anywhere else in the US? Mm -hmm. uh, then how do we know what we're about to embark on is actually the most effective mm -hmm. and efficient way to deliver foreign language instruction? Because I believe all 12 of us absolutely want to see foreign language brought to our students mm -hmm. at the early stage possible. Mm -hmm. But when I think about how this board has been very cautious for many years, even before I joined it, to do something this dramatic, mm -hmm. uh, I look at this extensive and very exciting and interesting report, but I gotta tell you right now today, I don't know how my colleagues and I are supposed to suddenly green light and say, here we go. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I do want to be a leader in this, but I want to be leading with knowledge and making sure that we already know what's effective instruction. So uh, things like correlation versus causality, um, I think Ms. Hines captured it best. Uh, yes, we might be seeing those students who are in those immersion programs performing better, mm -hmm. but we also happen to know that some of our most engaged and highly educated parents are the ones who, mm -hmm. who seek out these type of special programs. And so you can't necessarily sort out, it, was it the instruction they got, or is it the fact that they're coming from families where they've already had all that preparation beforehand? Mm -hmm. um, the comments of after school and weekends, you know, this is how we compensate for it. Mm -hmm. I can't help but think about my community um, and you know, watching how few of the children in the Woodson Pyramid were doing after school and weekend language development, mm -hmm. but, and many of them, the first exposure they got was middle school. Mm -hmm. And they're all doing very well in terms of taking a, second, uh, taking a foreign language in high school and getting the advanced diploma. So it's, I, I just want to be cautious sometimes where I feel like there's a lot of celebration of this is the way to go and I'm thinking, let's be mindful. We have a lot of our graduates right now who didn't have K through six flesh of any kind and they're exceptionally um, talented and do very well when they leave our schools. And so I just want to make sure we're approaching this um, in, in a very thoughtful way. So. Um, I, you know, one of the other questions I have was I was looking at the recommendations on you know getting some more international experience for our teachers, mm -hmm. and so originally the recommendation says the cost of twenty one thousand you know four hundred, mm -hmm. but then it says each year we want to increase that by five percent, and I'm thinking to myself, well, if we're increasing our teach you know the teacher. Uh, access to this 5% a year, what are we re referencing? Because I'm, what I read was they'll get to go travel for two to three weeks. Mm -hmm. So there are things in the report that sure. I think need a little more clarification, but mm -hmm. mostly where I'm concerned about is mm -hmm. we're talking about substantial mm -hmm. uh, funding mm -hmm. needs here. And I'm still also trying to sort through how we went from, you know, adding full day Mondays. And then in order to do the language through content, which again, until I, someone helps me understand why are we embarking on something that doesn't exist anywhere, mm -hmm. and we have to develop the curriculum, mm -hmm. then why is, it, why is this the best thing to be doing right now? Mm -hmm. So those are very important questions, and I'm very glad that you're asking them, because I think the school board needs to be comfortable with, you know, what is the research base for this and why are we moving forward? So there is a very, very solid and extensive research base on the efficacy of teaching language through content, regardless of what that content is. It can be language through science, language through math, language through integrated approach. But this is national research and international research that is the foundation upon which we're building this model. And 
as you look at our immersion models, we have been teaching language through science and language through math for over 25 years, and it's been very successful. And that's at a variety of programs and schools that have a variety of different socioeconomical backgrounds of students. So I think building on that national and international research is the model we're developing. And again, it's not new to Fairfax. We have been teaching language through science and math through those immersion programs over 25 years and very successfully. So, but Fairfax also likes to be on the leading edge. So yes, you are correct. We would be one of the first teaching language through the STEAM model and the, through the STEAM concepts. But again, that would be solid and based and increment gradually over time, as Dr. Presidio was mentioning. We would be piloting this, as you see, grade level by grade level and trying out the curriculum before it's expanded to the entire division. But uh, again, we have a good, solid research base of the language through content not only nationally, internationally, but also our own data analysis of the way we've been doing it here in Fairfax for 25 years. So we're trying to tackle the issue of full day Mondays and also bring in more language acquisition to our elementary school students. And we're already doing what you described. Then why wouldn't we be able to roll this out right now in terms of the existing curriculum we have? So it's being developed. Mm -hmm. I think that's where you're losing me is why you're saying you need to develop something, mm -hmm. but you're telling me we've been doing it for 25 right. years. Right. So <clears throat> that's there are a few things that we can roll out right now, mm -hmm. and then there are a few things that we need to develop over time. So we've got 46 existing FLESS programs at the elementary level. We have curriculum for those programs. Mm -hmm. We now have, with a full day Monday, the opportunity to take some of the, res the, the staffing allocation and use that to put world language programming at the elementary school into the triple T rotation for schools. So we can now move to all the programmatic things that are uh, contained in these recommendations, a 60 minute block of time, teachers, classroom, general mm -hmm. classroom teachers, grade level teachers using that period of time for individual or collaborative planning time. We can do all of those things in our existing 46 schools. What we can't do is we can't implement the new language through content curriculum, STEAM curriculum, because we haven't developed that yet. So in our immersion programs, and my son attends one of our immersion programs in Fairfax, half of his day is in English and half of his day is in Spanish, and the half that's in Spanish is math and science. So there are some components of STEAM mm -hmm. that we can start to introduce into our new elementary language programming, but not the integrated approach that really looks at it from a design perspective and really pushes students thinking around problem solving, project-based mm -hmm. learning. The content that we teach now is more of a traditional type of mm -hmm. math and science mm -hmm. content. Mm -hmm. What we're proposing doing in STEAM is more of an interdisciplinary okay. integrated approach. So that's going to take time to develop mm -hmm. because we have to develop some new activities. The other thing that's going to take us some time to put this in place right now is that in the 93 schools that don't have that language programming at the elementary level, we have to hire teachers. Mm -hmm. And we can't hire 93 teachers within a one year period of time. We've been pretty successful mm -hmm. in the past. Um, Not being in able a, this unique it, yeah, area. Yeah. Right. Correct. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, we can't hire 93 world language teachers at the elementary level um, in a one year period. We have been pretty successful in the past when we've done recruiting efforts of yielding a very robust applicant pool of around 20 to 25 mm -hmm. teachers. So that's how we've kind of based this five year implementation rollout based on past history and practice of doing the recruitment mm -hmm. um, with a variety of universities around the country. So some of the program programming we can implement now, but the additional teachers, 93 teachers, and the integrated approach to the language through content are the two pieces that will take some time to develop. And I'd just like to add that mm -hmm. in our existing FLES, FLES programs, we are reinforcing the content, not explicitly teaching the content as we do in the immersion program. So there is a difference in terms of what the, uh, the curriculum looks like. But I, I think what I'm, I'm still hearing two different things. One is we've done language through content already through mm -hmm. our immersion mm -hmm. programs. So for our existing 46 schools that have FLESS, mm -hmm. are you now going to, in September, not teach FLESS, but teach no. language through content? No. It'll be the existing FLESS curriculum 
for these years until it is developed for each of these grade levels and then the curriculum will be replaced year by year at these grade levels as the new curriculum is developed. But no, the new curriculum is not ready. So it'll be existing FLESS to continue until the new curriculum is developed. But that's, that's where my pushback is. You just told me for 25 Ms. years Ms. we've been doing May, this. Yeah. Um, we're shooting for 245. All right. That's. Okay. I guess then. So, I guess my my concern would be, I, I, Mr. Belkoff, could you clarify? Are we when we vote on this report today, it is a vote to green light and tell Dr. Garza you take these recommendations and put them into place? Because I'm not comfortable with that today. To me, this is just the start of this board considering what I think is a major shift in how we deliver K through six education, and I think I'm a a little worried about the language of, you know, approving this report, what that means. Of our charge at the end of this meeting will be to accept their report. The board has asked them to go off and produce a report, and we're going to accept that report. So we just and accept saying thanks for your work? Yes. But not, we're point. not saying we've approved any of the recommendations? We don't do that here. If, if there's a, an approval process that the board needs to do, that will come forward as an action item and as board business at a regular meeting. But my concern is we use our work sessions to be able to take the, the pulse of the board for what becomes the new action, new business action item. So can you clarify, is the goal here, maybe Dr. Garza can say it, that they're going to leave here today and I find this on our new business item to approve all these recommendations in, in two weeks? It, it, I might be able to help here. Um, in terms of moving forward and expanding where we can with our current FLESS, we can continue to do that like we have been. I think the programmatic change that's been official across the system is the fact that the core teacher, classroom teacher, does not have to be in the room with the FLESS teacher which is the reason why it's a much more cost-effective model. It really helps us in terms of our mission around full day Mondays. So nothing stopping us from that. And I think going to 60 minute design, which is also very helpful in terms of our principals. If you ask our principals, they will say that's gonna help them a lot. In terms of a new curriculum uh, model, and any expansion or changes to immersion and our secondary programs, I think we need to bring back a tighter recommendation. I think they've done a great job here, but I think we need a one-page um, document that says this is what we need and this is how much money we need to do that. And I think we can bring that at another time. I, I, I agree with Mr. Belkoff. This is probably not the time and place to ask for you to endorse or improve expenditure of dollars, but it is to set the stage for you all to think about how we might expand uh, into the future. And then I have one last question. I'd like uh, for the team at the end to consider, have we ever thought about having a full school-wide immersion, a school where everyone in the school is involved in the immersion mm -hmm. program? Mm -hmm. Yes, and there are other places around the country, of course, that do that. Here in Fairfax, the culture has been to always have the parents be able to opt into the program, in other words, opt out also. But that model is very effective and works around the country. That's not a model that has been uh, tried here in Fairfax. We had several of those in Houston, and we would have waiting lists of mm -hmm. parents that mm -hmm. wanted to get their children into those. So it would be right. great if we could try with one or two mm -hmm. and um, see what we could do with it. Okay, great. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, let's move on to uh, Ms. Schultz, be followed by Mr. Stork, Mr. McElveen, and then Mrs. Reed. Okay. Ms. Um, can we go to slide 20, please? So this is, um, it, I mean, there's a couple of hiccups for me in this report. Um, this is one. Um, because I'm the meeting manager, I happen to share this with staff ahead of time. Mm -hmm. um, I think being in a position where we are with our budget and things like uh, class size and things like actually direct delivery of language needs um, to spend nearly $100,000. Um, and I don't know, if I guess that's loaded, that's with benefits. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, sp spend nearly a hundred thousand at a at a district wide level on, um, uh, you know, outreach to embassies and whatnot. Uh, you know, I have spoken with um, with teachers. I mean, our, our teachers do some amazing things, and we've even heard some things and presentations to the full board during regular business sessions um, of work that they do through Skype across the world you know, with embassies, I mean, really just tremendous things. So I'm, I don't, I'm not comfortable at all spending division level money 
um, to do this because I think that I I think we we need to professionalize the teaching um, within the classroom and allow some of the liberties within the teachers and we can develop best practices and have teachers share you know um, across uh, uh, the the pyramids and the regions but I think that this is something that exists within our structure already and to add a position at the division level I'm not happy with I mean you're you're welcome to talk about this mm -hmm. but I only have one other really big thing um, is the ha it, basically the same thing as Ms. McLaughlin which is the the proprietary development of curriculum concerns me one it takes a tremendous amount of time mm -hmm. um, a tremendous amount of development and it's it, it's as if no one else in the universe has developed a curriculum to deliver elementary school foreign language. And, and I've got to believe that there's some off-the-shelf curriculum um, that's out there that even if it needed to be tweaked could be you know, embedded into FCPS a lot faster. And so then is the question really, you know, why does it take five years? Is it the curriculum development piece that's five years or is it hiring teachers? And when you say, oh, we've got to hire 93 or whatever teachers in order to do this, why not? I, I will bet you if we did a, a, a media campaign, um, if Dr. Garza went out and did a public a service, service announcement, we live in Fairfax County. I think if we tried to hire content teachers and said, hey, listen, in the next year, we need you to get certified. And, you know, this is what we're looking for. We're going to ramp up. And it's all, it's pedal to the metal. Um, let's go. I cannot believe that in 1.2 million people in as diverse a county as we have, that we couldn't snap up 100 language teachers um, within, you know, 12 to 18 months and and go. So I'm I'm on a... This is great, but the, the, the concept and the, the scare that I have in this is that we wind up expanding our current FLESS, which is 30-minute instruction twice a week. And to me, that's not foreign language instruction. That's foreign language familiarization. Mm -hmm. And so if we're going to do it, let's do it. Let's rip the Band-Aid off and go. <laughs> um, so let's get off-the-shelf curriculum and you know, tweak it however we need to to fit our stuff, and let's go on a, you know, a hiring blitz, you know, campaign. You know, let's get, you know, talk to the the papers and the television and everybody and say, hey, listen, are you a competent um, bi uh, bilingual um, person who wants to get certified as a teacher in Fairfax County? We're going. Mm -hmm. So I just like to know on those two things, you know what the thoughts are. I'd rather spend the 95000 on a campaign to hire 93 teachers. That's a thousand bucks a teacher, um, you know, for, for hiring and get them in and get them certified than to spend uh, 93000 here. So, Mrs. Schultz, I heard really three components there, so I'll try to address all three and we can add here. Uh, the first was on the cost for the one recommend or for the recommendations for the internationalization. And so that would be for one staff person, one resource person. That covers four broad recommendations in the report to expand all types of international opportunities. So that would be for the student international opportunities, expanding the international study travel and the international service programs that we have. That would also be for expanding international teacher experiences that we have. Yeah. I'm worried about the kids here yeah. mm -hmm. and the teachers here first. Mm -hmm. That's my first obligation. Um, and so the, the, you know, that's a great thing, but I also think that a lot of what gets done through that description mm -hmm. is done through a lot of the language teachers and, uh, and uh, the programs that exist mm -hmm. already. So okay. it's just that I, I have a compunction against building in another central office position to do this. I'd rather divert the resources back to the classroom. Mm -hmm. Just one thing, if I could. I, I, I appreciate your concern. Mm -hmm. uh, just for clarification for the entire board, um, the reason we're making this recommendation is because this was part of the charge that we were given by the board to 
expand what we currently do. Mm -hmm. And we do have staff currently that work on doing this at, within our department, within Teddy's department. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to say is we'll continue to do that and we can continue to do some great things, but it really depends on the board's level of interest in this particular area. And if we have a, a, a level of interest that's high enough on the part of the board, mm -hmm. then we probably are gonna need some additional resources to increase that, so. Right, and that would require the ability to expand the areas that you're just talking about, that would require additional resources as was pointed out. And that would have to come back to the board by way of a formal recommendation. Um, so, but, I, but in terms of another part of what you were talking about, in terms of certification um, in, and our legislative uh, kind of advocacy, uh, in recent past, um, the State Department has made the certification of foreign world language teachers at the elementary level very, very difficult for us. And in fact, caused some consternation on the part of some of our staff uh, as we had to make some of those changes. So it is, it is not as easy as one might think, unfortunately, uh, to, to have folks meet the certification requirements. Uh, and we're gonna be meeting very soon with Steve Staples, the superintendent of schools here in Virginia. So could you speak very briefly on the certification mm -hmm. changes that are yes. required? Yeah. yeah, for the immersion teachers, uh, a change went into effect just recently in the last year or so to require immersion teachers to not only have world language certification but also have general elementary certification on top of their K-12 world language certification. So that is a very stringent requirement now that we've been working with the state back and forth on. Um, so that is one reason it's been difficult to recruit and get teachers that have both of those certifications or have the language proficiency and the immersion. So we're continuing that advocacy to make sure that we get a better situation out of that. And vice versa, oftentimes we have teachers that meet the certification requirements in the content area and are strong bilingual. You know, they, they speak another language very, very well, but they don't hold that particular certification. So it's something that I hope our State Department will you know, work with us on as we look to expand these programs. Okay. All right, very good. Uh, let's move on to Mr. Stork. Thank you, Mr. Velikoff. Uh, first off, I think it's a wonderful report. I'm, I'm very pleased that we have this opportunity to continue to move this forward. I am a deep believer in foreign language instruction in elementary schools. Um, totally sold, totally committed. I think it's more important than AAP, frankly, at the elementary school level, and at least a center-based AAP. So uh, if there's ever that kind of trade-off, I know where I'm going to be, which is here. And I tell any parent I ever talk to, and most parents we know when their kids are young, they're worried about making sure they're in the best classes, advanced, et cetera. And I say, focus your energy and time on learning a language because that's a skill that, that they'll never ever lose if they learn it early enough. So um, I'm deeply concerned though about the reduction in the frequency. I understand it, how it's tying into our, our full day Mondays, but mm -hmm. to me, learning anything, I need more than once a week. I just, I don't mm -hmm. keep it and, and that's, I don't know if you've talked about that. I mean, reduce it from twice a week to one time. Even if it's a half hour each time, that was, to me, more powerful than one time. Where did you all end up with that? And is it just a matter of this is what we got to work with and so we'll take it? Or is this something you believe it'll still work? And, and Dr. Pateras, if you would clarify, mm -hmm. it was my understanding this report was actually done prior, for you all prior to oh, uh, the true. full day Mondays even mm -hmm. being considered. And that recommendation was included in the original report. Right. So unless I'm, unless I, you, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. I invite you to do that. Mm -hmm. But I understand that recommendation really is absence, I mean, is, is disconnected from okay. the full day Mondays. Mm -hmm. Does it help? I think it does. But it was a recommendation from principals, I believe. Right. It was a recommendation from principals, but also looking at uh, the kind of model we're looking to moving towards 21st century skills, project-based, problem-based learning through STEAM concepts that really takes that hour of being together and working on the projects and pro, you know, problem-based learning together and it would be difficult to do in two one-half hour sections. There would not be sufficient time. So it really will concentrate the language through that kind of learning with 21st century skills in a one-hour block. Supplemental support as well? Mm -hmm. Sorry, well? Just one other thing to add on um, Teddy's comment. Um, again, going back and looking at the research on that um, actful slide that we looked at in terms of the number of years to get to communicative mm -hmm. competence. Mm -hmm. um, again, that research is based on the between 60 to 90 minutes a week. Mm -hmm. And there are different models mm -hmm. that different schools use. And the once a week model is a fairly common model actually mm -hmm. that's used in elementary practice um, because you have some continuous learning time. Lots of times if you have a you know a 30 minute model and you're moving classrooms and having to walk kids from classroom to classroom, yeah. you know, you reduce the amount of time down to, yeah. to very little. Um, and again, so looking at that national 
research in the national model, and then also looking at the program evaluation that uh, our evaluation office did that said, you know, our current 60 minutes a week is getting students to the benchmarks we need to get them at. That's where we came up with 60 minutes. It's always nice to have more time, yeah. uh, but the same thing would be true if you talk to a, an art teacher or a band and strings teacher. I mean, we always want that additional instructional time. But I think you raise a very important question, which is if we move to this model of 60 mm -hmm. minutes once a week, we need to track and evaluate to make sure that our kids mm -hmm. are still on the same trajectory mm -hmm. that they have been on. Because it's our hypothesis that they will be, but we need to know that and we need to track and monitor that all along. I also think that we need to develop some suggested practices for principals about how do you take that language that's been identified mm -hmm. at yes. that school and make yes. it more part of the school culture mm -hmm. yes. and not right. just that class. That's right. where I've seen it be very effective. Mm -hmm. So it's part of the morning yes. announcements. It's part of right. you know just mm -hmm. different things that they do. Some of their programming, special programming, right. music programs, for mm -hmm. example. So there's a way to make it not a separate class, and it's only just that that class, Mr. Stork, right. which I think is Absolutely. what you're that's talking ties about. Exactly right into us. I think that's the way yes. we reinforce it. If you only have the hour, right. we've got many great models of schools doing that already. It could be replicated, right? And then the cognitive flexibility. That's I mean. That's uh, definitely what everything I've ever read. And then mm -hmm. you talk about aging the mind and healthcare. Everybody tells you as you age, you know, having another mm -hmm. language and using that as a That's way of keeping another. your brain more, you know, plast plastic and adaptable. And mm -hmm. so I know that's, mm -hmm. I think that all ties together. Um, 21 sites for um, the full day in the, for the immersion, how and when, and does that include kindergarten? Mm -hmm. Yes, the two-way immersion model is K through six, and that would be you know half a day in the target language, half a day in English. Um, again, that could be scaled up because it's a very low or almost no cost model, cost neutral for staffing. Uh, that can be added at any time, so we plan on continuing to expand that model. Well, do you model. intend that to do that like immediately? It's a no cost model, why right. not? I mean, just a matter of finding the right teachers, right? Yeah, so it just needs a little bit of support for the professional development there, materials as stated in the so report. So that's 2014, 2015, 2016, Right. In fact, we're starting we one additional school next year, and then the goal would be to expand as much as possible uh, for the subsequent years. In the report, there is a breakout of that. Um, I believe it's about five schools per year. I'll find yeah, that. Yeah, I, I saw that. So, but there's but there's really no barrier other than hiring teachers is what I heard. So mm -hmm. that's why I'm I'm pushing back a little bit on that. And then the other one is the critical language, uh, five regional sites. Um, I. Is, how is that different than different from the 21 sites? Is that mm -hmm. just to make sure that we have the regional availability right. for right. people who want to elect right. a particular language? Right. Or is that so, so the world that? language model that we're talking about the, for the critical languages, that yes. does not require a certain number of native speakers of the language. Unfortunately, languages like Chinese, Arabic, some of these, we do not have um, schools that have these large populations in one school. So we look more to like a zone of proximity, have the base school offer the model and pull in students students through a lottery process in a zone of proximity to approximate a two-way immersion model that, for staff. The two-way immersion model, you just kind of hit something on which I'm, <laughs> you said you, the implication, I know it's part of the intent, and I, mm -hmm. I buy that in general, but is it exclusively intended to be native speakers? I mean, is that exclusively how you want to see that move forward, or is there? It's 50-50, half native speakers, half native speakers yeah. of English. Yeah, I got that, but yeah. but I have Fort Hunt Elementary School, my right. area, right? Yeah. That's not the model that it has as an immersion model, but not a two-way, or not a 50-50 um, split anyways. Mm -hmm. is, do you anticipate that these 21 sites are, are set up exclusively to be the 50-50 combination, or is that the only way you're willing to do those? Yeah. I'm, that would I'm ha they have the population to do the two-way immersion, so that would be the, you know, the best option for but them. They, but also, if they don't, they, they, right. they're not precluded from, that's really the question I'm asking, right. they're not precluded from a, the immersion. Yeah, an additional piece of the, this is that uh, nearly all of those 21 schools have very high LEP population, English learner populations, okay. and this model is the best model for learning English okay. as a second language, right? So, so it's an additional benefit for those schools and those students. So that was the approach that we took. But again, you know, at the table, Dr. Garza mm -hmm. raised the idea that we could look at some full immersion programs mm -hmm. as well. So, right. I mean, we're open to other models. Yes. Okay. And I, I Fortnite Elementary School would be a perfect place to have a mm -hmm. school-wide immersion because there's two other elementary schools in the area. Mm -hmm. People don't want to send their kids there. And I don't, I know we don't have time because I see the 
the, the hook about ready to come my way. Um, <laughs> but the needier schools, uh, kids, I mean, my focus on that has to be, I think you need languages that are relevant to the kids that are there. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Japanese for a very needy mm -hmm. population where there's no Japanese kids doesn't work. And I realize mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. was selected because we try to have a broad range of languages, mm -hmm. but it doesn't work. I don't. Th I think it's a mistake for some of our neediest mm -hmm. schools, and we clearly need to be focused on literacy. But I do believe mm -hmm. that you can do both. Um, but there has to be a connection to the kids, and I mm -hmm. think the more you can connect those kids, if you have obviously a needier population, a lot of Hispanic kids, you can tie those together. I think that's that's a, a win-win for everybody. So I would mm -hmm. encourage. And it, and it ensures that students, in particularly maybe potentially high poverty students are also uh, very literate in their own language mm -hmm. and they can you know learn the proper grammar and writing and, and uh, in their in their own native language as well which oftentimes right. is not is sometimes weak. Right. right that's why that model is the most effective for English learners as well because they're learning to read in their home language and learning English at the same time the last comment is that I think we should have international experience and I think we ought to find a way to allow juniors and or seniors to spend a year overseas and and still mm -hmm. be able to graduate from Travis County Public Schools so I, I think we have to find a way and I'm I'm right there with anybody who wants to join me in that mm -hmm. So, Mr. Storga, I'm uh, not concerned about my brain being plastic, but I am a little concerned that by the end of the day it's going to be silly putty. <laughs> um, let's move on to uh, Mr. McElveen. Thank you, Mr. Velkoff. Um, I am so proud of this report, um, and I think it is the... Um, the example of what uh, Dr. Garza says when we cannot engage in deficit thinking as a board. And I think it speaks to um, your work, um, mm -hmm. Teddy. We're, we're so sorry to, that you're leaving, and we do hope that, Dr. Presidio, you find someone that, that can continue to shepherd this along with Greg and Sam and, and everyone else. Um, but thank you all so much for this work. Um, and, you know, M Mr. Moon didn't talk about it, but, but I will. Um, this board has come so far in, in less than a decade. Um, when, when previous boards have had members say, we should only be focusing on teaching English in Fairfax County, to our board that where all of us agreed to um, uh, task staff with, with putting together this report. So that's very powerful, mm -hmm. and that's why this is such a powerful report. Um, and Dan, you know, I agree with some of your concerns. Um, one hour a week is not enough, but I'll take what I can get at this point, um, if all our students can get it. Um, one, one piece of this that, that um, w was a little weaker than I had hoped was the internationalization piece. And, and Mr. Stork, you, you, you spoke to this a little bit. Um, for those of you who don't know, my, my wife is a Chinese teacher at Sidwell um, um, in DC, uh, and they offer a semester a broad program, for example, in rural China, among other places, where students are able to get their full core curriculum um, and uh, be able to do so um, in, in a location where they can really perfect their, their Chinese or whatever language. And um, I was really hoping the internationalization portion of this would be more forward thinking than it was. But at the same time, I realized that we have to get the basics down first. And that's why I think that one position um, to do all of those uh, very important things is, is worth it. And um, what perhaps most frustrates me about this conversation is this report gives us an opportunity to, to move beyond FLESS. And this board, I know half of it at least, is pissed that we have FLESS to begin with. <laughs> um, and you know, I've not always been happy with FLESS either. But this gives us an opportunity to move beyond FLESS. So I don't understand why we're hearing such consternation when we can finally say goodbye to FLESS, get content uh, through language, and, and uh, move on. And um, I do hope my colleagues that, that have um, thrown water at this will, will consider um, how far this will be able to take us uh, away from the current model, which, which they so despise. The minutes of the meeting will record that board members are unhappy with Fles. And Mrs. Reed. Thank you, and I'm glad to be following Mr. McElveen. And first, I also want to thank you for your creative thinking and visionary work here. Um, it gives us a lot to think about and discuss. 
Um, and what I, what I would like to do, though, is focus a little bit more on the shorter term view. Um, I agree with you where we would want to head, and I, I see you have laid out an ambitious uh, schedule to roll things out within five years. But the current state of affairs, I think many would agree, it's troublesome. The fact that 30% of our students mm -hmm. receive foreign language instruction, the lucky 4% of that get immersion by lottery in some cases, mm -hmm. but then 70% poor kids don't get anything at all. And so uh, even in the best case where you describe your rollout, mm -hmm. it'll take years to really change what some of us view as an inferior uh, FLESS program. And so my question would be, um, could we, uh, not this moment, but could we think about how we could improve what we have currently while simultaneously still planning for um, you know, the, the nirvana, if you will, mm -hmm. of foreign language instruction. Um, that would be something that I would be very interested in uh, learning about. I did go through and read the program evaluation study, and it is less than glowing on the current state of FLESS. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously, there's some pieces of it that are very good uh, with the recommendation to continue with modification, but um, things like a third of the FLESS students did not meet the language proficiency benchmark. That's not exactly, you know, an overwhelming endorsement. And the fact that a full six years um, didn't necessarily make much of a difference as opposed to three years. So um, things like that make me think that, well, may, while there may be some good components, some good solid components there, perhaps it would be... Uh, worthwhile to think about how we might be able to tweak in the shorter term, uh, given that this piece is so uh, critical to now what we, we, we can't help but tie to the full day Mondays. So I wondered if you have talked about that or if you had any initial thoughts or if perhaps we could uh, put that up for further discussion another time, mm -hmm. kind of the shorter term focus on improving foreign language instruction for everybody. And that may include uh, doing away with, I hate to say it, just as an option or a crazy idea, you know, to take immersion and, you know, are there ways that we could, you know, cl clone those teachers almost? I mean, like someone said, I mean, you've got that curriculum. Mm -hmm. I, I sat in on that uh, at, at one of the schools, Kent Gardens, and it's fabulous. I wish we could do that for everyone. So I'll be quiet now and let you speak. Mm -hmm. So just on the immersion curriculum, just to highlight and sort of clarify that, that is the regular curriculum. That's the regular math, science, social studies, language arts that students in an all English program get. So that's not a separate or different curriculum. It's just the regular curriculum we offer everyone in immersion. So just to clarify that point. Um, in terms of developing or tweaking the FLESS curriculum or techniques and simultaneously developing the new language through content STEAM approach, that would take additional resources to try to do both of those things simultaneously. Um, and so that would be a question we'd have of priorities of the school board. Would you want time and attention and resources focused on developing the new curriculum or on enhancing, changing the FLESS curriculum. The FLESS curriculum is based on our current program of studies. It is up to date, and it is an integrated approach of language, arts, science, social studies, and math. Again, it's those four integrated. This STEAM focus would be a new focus on the STEAM concepts and more project-based and problem-based learning. So it would really be a resource question, too, in terms of, you know. But, but just to be clear, we would develop the new curriculum over that five-year period of time. And as curriculum components became available, even in year one, those would be inserted into the instructional rotation. So it's only five years to get the entire curriculum developed. And it's possible that that could be developed sooner. We're just trying to provide you with what we think are you know, prudent estimates at this point in time. Just like it may be possible for us to hire more teachers sooner than our past experiences has been, but we're just trying to, again, provide you with you know, some objective measure of how long we think it might take based right. on past experience. Yeah. But that's a very important point. The new curriculum would replace each grade level as, it's, as it is um, developed. So wouldn't, we wouldn't need to wait five years for everything, right? right. May I add to that real quickly? And I apologize. I know we're tight on time, but I think it's important. Um, on the, on, the, on the language competencies, because that's what you were speaking to, mm -hmm. and how many of the students demonstrated proficiency mm -hmm. on those identified language competencies. Yes. And forgive me if it's in here, but do we have any evidence to suggest that a student who's been in any of our FLESS programs and they matriculated into a middle school that had that same language program, mm -hmm. that they were situated, uh, they, were, they were better prepared 
-hmm. for language study at the middle school level than those who are not. Do we have evidence to yeah. suggest that's true or not? Our FLESS students, the big bubble of students, just completed seventh grade this year. So this is the first year our big bubble of uh, uh, elementary FLESS students came up to seventh grade, so we don't have longitudinal data beyond seventh grade now, but that is something we want to track and we want to analyze. But what we do have from our immersion students is we did an analysis of the data to see with our immersion students what percent of those students take upper level language courses like level four, level five, AP, or IB. And we found that 73%, almost three fourths of immersion students, do continue and take a level four or five or AP or IB as compared with non immersion students, only 25% of those students take an upper level language. So when you look at continuity and will they become effective language learners and reach that communicative competence, we see the students that have had that elementary entry language experience through our immersion program do continue. And of course, we think those students also do well in other subjects as well. I think we need to continue to track that. Yes. And to, to Ms. Reed's point, uh, we, need to, we need to follow the seventh grade, current seventh grade students, those that were in FLESS, and, and you know, hopefully those results will show that that really made a difference. Yes. Okay, we've all had a chance to speak. We're already a half hour behind. Ms. Strauss uh, lost her train of thought. I'm going to recognize her for one last comment, and then I, and then we want to wrap it up. Okay, thank Ms. you Strauss. very quickly. Yeah, I wanted to be back to the teacher certification because one of my schools has had a very difficult time um, as the immersion mm -hmm. teachers, many of them certified uh, in the language, but but more appropriately in high school, and they have mm -hmm. left the elementary program and have gone on to high school rather than go back and mm -hmm. get their um, elementary certification. So um, we are partnering with local schools to help alleviate that problem. Mm -hmm. George Mason, yes. Marymount, okay. Mm -hmm. As I know, I have schools that are, are desperately mm -hmm. waiting for that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, is Hutchison the two-way Spanish immersion? Are we going to get that in the fall? Yes. Yay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Um, and uh, uh, yes, Kent Gardens has done STEAM and all the rest of that for years. But they mm -hmm. were the first program to come in as a result of money from Congressman Wolf. So it's been there for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. And they have, they have had interesting uh, implementation of French across the entire school and science mm -hmm. and, and, and arts. And we know how to teach science and arts. So mm -hmm. writing the curriculum, and we write curriculum every summer across many areas. Mm -hmm. So it just is time. And, but we, I mean, we know how to teach mm -hmm. those subjects. So we just combine them. All right. Um, thank you. So Hutchison's going forward. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. OK, I'm going to ask if there is any objection to accepting the report that we've been given. Hearing no uh, objection, we'll accept the report. I believe that there is one action item, which was from Ms. Darinet Koufax, which was to, um, um, I don't know what you've written, but it was to get a list of the schools that have 35% uh, or more that would be eligible for dual immersion, two-way immersion, yeah. Mr. Stork. I just, I guess we need some sort of follow-up next steps on this. I just know in general, I, I know there's a lot of interest in moving this forward, but I don't know what that is. If somebody could speak to that, and then get, at least have something we know what's next. On. Well, this was really for the purposes of a conversation and getting some direction from the board. Now I think the staff we need to take this and develop a, you know, essentially a, rec a one recommendation for you all to consider that would have the dollar amount specified. So I think we need to provide a little bit more in terms of a detailed recommendation. Would you agree, Dr. Presidio, that that yes, is the appropriate I, next I step? Yes, I agree, and I have that as uh, one of our next steps. Okay, so they'll be bringing Just, forward an action item. That's fine. Eventually. In some kind of time frame, like next week, next year, next whatever. What Some sense of some ballpark that we'll be in for this? I, any? I think most of, most of the legwork is here. So I think we're talking probably in the next month. Well, next month you don't have any board meetings. So maybe September? Uh, we can prepare it quite early and then uh, I, I believe the and superintendent just let the and, chair and, our, and our chair and vice can chair put on the agenda. Yes. As appropriate. Yep. So, I'm sorry. So, can I just ask, Claire, so what we're saying is in September we'll get an update of where we are on this or, I, I mean, the next step is like what happens next i mean i and I, I know i'm channeling miss reed sometimes we talk about things here and they just sort of vaporize so what 
what is the what's the big next step? Not the little next step, but next step capital. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I believe the next step in terms of what staff work needs to do is we need to develop a, an implementation plan with some recommendations around dollars that would be necessary uh, for uh, these particular areas. I think the the um, conversation was well structured. It was, but it was in bits and it was in different places. I think it needs to be pulled together into one. Uh, recommendation moving forward. I also think that we can add some additional information now that we have full day, you know, a full day on Mondays. How that might affect the current plus program and how we'll be able to expand that over time. Well, then my only my only question would be: Is there anything that you heard today from the discussion, from the kinds of questions that by the time we see this next, there could be some changes? You think there, like? Is the, is the tenor of the board such that by the time we see this again, you'll go, you know, maybe we'll look at off-the-shelf curriculum, or I don't know. Elizabeth, what I see happening is, is with, with many of these things is we'll go back to staff. They'll give us some time. I saw Teddy's face say maybe a little bit longer, and she won't be here. But um, rather than September, maybe early early fall, we will see something back. Then we will review that in. Um, Mr. Valkoff and I will review that. We will bring that back most likely to another work session and then follow up for action after that. And I, I would add that um, the practical impact will be that there will be some budgetary requests and that we will need to give the superintendent some guidance about how to handle those as she puts together her proposed budget. Um, Correct. And, I, and the yeah, other sorry. thing, just, just to say, I, I think today's work session is jam-packed, and I can't say this enough today. We all need to be very mindful as we go forward and as we go into this retreat that our coming weekend that there are many things that we are talking about today that we will need to look at and prioritize as we go forward, and we talk about that in, in, in terms of our retreat. So, And this, I would say, is one of them. Okay, I want to recognize Ms. McLaughlin and then Ms. Hines. Ms. McLaughlin. I think where my concern is, and Ms. Schultz tapped on it, is what what did Dr. Garza hear? Because, um, you know, I, I tried to send some clarification to one of my colleagues just now about the, the thoughtful consternation is not about throwing water on you know, another program, it's saying, we don't know yet. I mean, staff did this great report, but what they said is we now have to develop the curriculum. So how on earth do we know as a board that yes, we will get to replace FLESS with some, with some, which some of us felt didn't necessarily have the most effective language instruction, but I wanna make sure that what we replace it with is actually superior to what we were doing because otherwise we're just replacing one week program with another week program so when i hear they might come back in a month i think well wait a minute you just told us it'll take a couple years to develop curriculum for language through content so i'd rather it not be rushed but when you do come back to us it's not just the budgetary implications but we have a clearer sense of how exactly are you planning to deliver this new approach to language through content. So it's not just a concept, but we actually have a much better sense of what the program is, because that, that's what I think we couldn't really get to today, obviously. I think this is a very important uh, change in our instruction delivery, and I want to make sure we get it right. So I'm not wanting to put the brakes on. I'm just saying let's make sure staff can bring us information and that keep, tells us something. And keep in mind to that point, as I think it was stated earlier, we, we can't move forward on the change to the curriculum or any curriculum design work until at some point in the near future and maybe even next year's budget, we have some resource to do that. So it's not like next week we're going to start developing a new and different approach. We can't do that. We don't have resources dedicated to that. So currently, the FLESS program that we're talking about will continue this next year, the current one we have now, with some modifications that I think are good modifications, um, but there's not going to be any new design or different direction until the board takes some action to help uh, dedicate, dedicate some resource to that. Okay, folks. Uh, remember, we're approaching 45 minutes behind. I've got two more folks, and then we're going to take one last look up here. Um, Mrs. Smith and Mr. Moon. This is when it starts to get tricky because you have a 
couple, uh, I thought we were going to start to develop the curriculum in the next year. So, and I'm not going to belabor this right now, but I, I thought we were moving forward. I, in my mind, the curriculum piece is something that's more staff developed staff work, that the resource piece where we have to add positions and do stuff, those will come forward in budget or, or, or things like that. So um, I think we do have to look back because the positions that Dr. Pradaris talked about earlier were for the purposes of write, rewriting our curriculum. So we have to bring back to you all at some point in the near future recommendation and and we have to look back and see if there's any place else we can potentially fund some of this work if that's necessary but i guess the point is we will continue with FLESS. i, I think it's a strong i think i sense strong support for us moving forward i think there's a real opportunity given our new re, these resources for full day mondays to do more of this um, but in terms of through the steam and that's going to take some curriculum work. So I think that's why we need to come back with a, a tighter recommendation, really, of what's needed and what that timeline might be. And I think it could be in, I suggested September. I think it needs to be right around the corner, even if um, the board says, can't do that right now, but let's put that into 15, you know, fiscal year 16. But I think it needs to be brought back sooner than later. Mr. Bernard. Uh, first of all, I'm not going to just accept the blanket statement about weakness of our FLAS program. You know, certainly two hours a week is better than one hour a week. Three hours is, will be better than two hours. One hour every day will be much better than what you have. So uh, if that's what we mean by the program curriculum being weak, then I'll, I'll accept that. But however, you know, given the you know, limited resources, the limited amount of time, you know, we can give to our students, I am not sure that I can accept FLESS is a weak program. Uh, having said that, I mean, I must agree with Mrs. Smith that I thought that, uh, that we would be developing. Uh, uh, I mean, I accept Mrs. Schultz's suggestion that if there is off the shelf, you know, curriculum available somewhere in the country, go find it. Go find it. If there isn't, we have to come up with a something, you know, something of our own that we need, we'll need to have resources. We need to have someone to develop the program. Uh, yeah, ideally, ideally, we put something in our year end review as a, as a, as a budget line item. So that so that you know board you know board will vote on that to see the clear guidance to the staff to either hire or not hire do it or not do it if uh, the board feels that uh, that we need more time for the staff to look into uh, some of these uh, uh, the board members have suggested and have a little more time for the board's consideration to make a final decision what it could potentially do is a place a placeholder in the year end of review, but do not make a final decision on whether to use the money or not until we, the staff returns with a further refined recommendation, be it September or be it October or even later part. But I would certainly want to see uh, there's some sort of uh, a curriculum being developed over the course of the next year so that come FI 16, we can formally implement what they want to implement. Okay, Ms. Dernett Kofax, you're betting clean up here. Uh, just following up on Mr. Moon's statement and from what I understand from staff currently um, about the curriculum piece is that our best minds here do not believe and they have already researched um, that there there is not really currently a curriculum that exists. They can c continue to, to look for this, um, but there is not one that they find that they are satisfied with or that they have found which will fit into the way we are looking at things. So I think that's important for us as a board to understand, and um, that's where we are. Okay, thank you. So I'm just going to read the second next step, which says to develop an implementation plan and present it to the board in the fall, perhaps as soon as September 2014. Ms. Evans. Um, in this discussion, some of us, uh, some people said that they would expect to see another work session after we got an implementation plan. Is that the, is that the plan uh, mm -hmm. to to have another work session once we have an implementation plan? Um, I mean, I see people how, shaking their head no, and I see people not. say this? Uh, refer to. How about if we refer this to the judgment of the chair? 
uh, to schedule whether or not to schedule a work session. Is that fair? I would think that's fair. What, well, if you wanted to, I, I'll be fine to take a um, a brief uh, sense of the board. Um, would those who would like to wait? What do you guys have questions? Just, I just have a question about what we're voting on here. Um, we are voting on whether or not um, we will come back to pro let's just say another work session. Staff, staff will bring us back something in um, early fall and whether or not we would like to have another work session to review that information. Okay, so will we be deciding now whether or not to have a work session? Yes. I mean, if we say no now, that doesn't preclude us from deciding later that we want correct. to talk about it again. Correct, okay. but the, the, my, my, And because people do not want the chair to have that prerogative, where I think it's fine, where we've done it many times before, that the uh, we look at it and, you know, we can discuss it. But my inclination would be to have another work session. So that's where I am. Mr. McElwain. My move is to take a sense on the board if we want to give the chair that prerogative to make that decision. Okay. Let's have a vote. So I move, I move that we give the chair the prerogative to determine if we need another work session. All those in favor? Oh, second. All right. And a sense of the board is that that would be okay. Thank you. Okay, it's 3.15, can we five-minute break. Five break, come back at 3.20?